ME204, Potential and Kinetic Energy of a Particle. Let's take a look at energy. Energy is something that we can define as the capacity to do work. We have mechanical energy, which is composed of kinetic energy, which is our motion, and our potential energy, which is stored energy. But we could also have electrical energy and thermal energy. There are lots of forms of energy that we could account for. In this class, we're just going to talk about mechanical energy and focus on our kinetic and potential energy. Part of working with energy is understanding work. Work is the product of an applied force for a known distance. We'll use the letter W for work. If we have a constant force, our work is defined as the force times the change in distance that that force is applied. If we have a changing force, where our force is a function of position, like this graph here, then we add up a whole bunch of small pieces of work to get the total amount of work done. That means that we take the area under the curve. When we take the area under a function, or the area under a curve, we integrate to find that answer. So work is the integral of the force, ds. Units for work are, in metric, newtons times meters force times the distance, which is a joule. In the English system, it's pound-feet. Here's an example. Note that no work is done if there's no displacement. If I have a thousand-pound rock and I pull on it with ten pounds of force, and the rock doesn't move, how much work was done? Well, my work is equal to force times the change in position, which is ten pounds of force times zero feet. So zero work is done. Forces only do work if they're in the same direction as the motion or the displacement. So now I have a 20 pound rock, we're on a very slippery surface, I pull on it with 10 pounds and it moves 15 feet. Now how much work was done? In this case my work is equal to my force times my displacement, which is equal to 10 pounds times 15 feet, or 150 pound feet. Why didn't the 20 pound weight figure into the work that was done? The 20 pound weight is in a different direction than the displacement. There's no displacement vertically in this problem, it's only horizontally. So the 20 pounds doesn't contribute to the work in any way. What if a person gave the block a short 10 pound push and then let it slide for 5 feet? Well, in this case, work would only be accomplished over the distance that the force was actually being applied. Work is negative if the force is in the opposite direction of the displacement. What if we've got a surface that's not very slippery? Say our coefficient of kinetic friction is 0.3. In this particular problem, we'd have a weight of 20 pounds, a normal force of 20 pounds, and a friction force, a kinetic friction force, of 0.3 times my normal force, which would be 6 pounds. If that friction is applied over the whole 15 feet that we pull on the rock with 10 pounds, how much total work was done? There's two ways that we can approach this. We can look at the net force in the direction of the motion, times the distance, or we can take each piece separately. We could look at the 10 pound force and multiply it by the 15 foot distance, and we could take the 6 pound force, which is in the opposite direction, so it would be negative, and multiply it by the 15 foot distance. In that case, our work would be equal to 10 pounds times 15 feet minus 6 pounds times 15 feet which would be 60 pound-feet. Note that any work that is contributing or adding to the energy of the system is positive. Any work or any forces that are taking away energy from the system would be negative. The 10 times 15 is the work done by the person pulling the rock, and the negative work is the friction that's in the opposite direction of the motion. Why didn't the object's weight nor the normal force contribute to the work in this case? The weight and the normal force are not in the direction of displacement, so they don't directly contribute to the work. However, we do know that our friction force is dependent on the normal force, so indirectly our normal force can contribute to the work. Forces only do work if they're in the same direction as the motion. Now I've got 10 pounds of force being pulled at a 30 degree angle over 15 feet. My coefficient of kinetic friction is still 0.3, and so if I solve for my normal force, I've got a 15 pound normal force, and my friction would then be 4.5 pounds. How much total work was done? In this case, as far as the force applied by the person pulling the rock, our force is 10 times the cosine of 30. We're only interested in the force that's in the direction of the motion. 10 cosine of 30 times the distance, the displacement, 15 feet minus our friction, which is 4.5 pounds times the 15 feet, which would give me 62.4 pound feet. 
Notice that only the component in the direction of the displacement does any work, and we have negative work due to the friction because the force is acting opposite the direction of the displacement. Now let's talk a little bit about energy. There are two types of energy in mechanical systems that we're going to talk about. One is kinetic energy, which is the energy of a moving object. Two is potential energy, or stored energy, that could be used at a later time or converted to kinetic energy. Gravity is one source of potential energy. An object that's way up high has stored energy. A spring is another source of potential energy. A cocked or compressed or stretched spring has stored energy in it. For kinetic energy, or the energy of a moving object, we use the equation Ke, or kinetic energy, is equal to one-half the mass of the object times the velocity squared. Again, this is a moving object. One-half mass times velocity squared. Just in case you're interested in where this equation comes from, let's take a look at our force equals mass times acceleration equation. Now when we're dealing with work and energy, we're interested in forces over distances, forces being applied over a distance. We have a definition for acceleration, that's a change in velocity with respect to time, but we're not interested in how much time it takes at this point. We are interested in the distance that's associated with that acceleration. We have another equation, ADS equals VdV, that we could use to substitute into our force equation, F equals ma. If we solve for our acceleration, then our acceleration is equal to V dV over dS. Substituting this in to our F equals ma equation, and rearranging it so that we take the small change in distance over to the side of the equation that has the force, we get F dS equals mass velocity dV. If we integrate both sides, then on the left side of the equation, we've already stated that work is the integral of the force dS. On the right side of the equation, the first portion, 1 half mv squared, this is our mv2, this is our final kinetic energy, and the minus 1 half mv1 squared is our initial kinetic energy. So our work causes changes in kinetic energy. Now let's talk about potential energy. This is the potential to do work. First of all, gravity. When something is up high, then it has the potential to drop to a lower state and increase velocity as it drops. We also have springs that we need to deal with. So potential energy of gravity, if we have a 150 pound person and they're 15 feet above the ground, how much potential energy do they have? How much work could be done if they were to fall from that height? Well, work is a force times a distance. In this case, we have an object that has a weight. And so a weight is a force, and a height of that object is a distance. So weight times the height would give us the potential energy due to gravity. So our equation for potential energy is mass times gravity times the height, or weight times the height. In this particular problem, our work is equal to 150 pounds, times 15 feet, or 2,250 pound-feet. This is the amount of stored energy in a 150-pound object held at 15 feet. That stored energy, if the person were to drop, could be converted into kinetic energy. Now let's review springs from our statics classes. Some basic concepts. Unstretched length. The unstretched length of a spring is the free length of the spring. This is the length of the spring if it were unattached to any object, it wasn't compressed or stretched, it's just laying on the table without anything affecting it. Displacement is how much a spring is compressed or stretched from its free length. A spring constant is the force required to deflect the spring one unit length. For example, if we have 10 pounds and we use that 10 pounds to compress a spring one inch, then our spring constant is 10 pounds per inch. The force in a spring is equal to our spring constant times its displacement. So do springs exert a constant force? No, they don't. It changes linearly with displacement. Notice that force equals a spring constant times a changing position. It's a first order equation, so it's a linear equation. So our force changes linearly. Let's look at this toy gun as an example. It has an unstretched length of 90 millimeters that the spring does. When the gun's assembled in the factory, they pre-compress the spring to 70 millimeters long, and then when the spring is cocked and ready to fire, it's 50 millimeters long. Let's figure out what the spring deflections are before and after firing. If our loose spring, when it's not in the gun at all, is 90 millimeters, 
That's its unstretched or free length. When we put it into the gun, it's pre-compressed so that the spring's length is now 70 millimeters. And then when we cock the gun and get it ready to fire, the spring's length is 50 millimeters. After firing, it returns to this original position of 70 millimeters. If we look at it unstretched before firing and after firing, we can determine what the displacement is that we would use to calculate the force in the spring or the energy associated with the spring. So what is my initial displacement before firing? Well, the free length is 90 millimeters. The compressed length is 50 millimeters. So the change in length then is 40 millimeters. After we fire, what is our final displacement? The unstretched length or the free length is 90 millimeters. After it's fired, it's at 70 millimeters, so we still have some compression in the spring. That compression is 20 millimeters. So let's talk about the potential energy stored in a spring. We want to know how much work was done to compress the spring or to stretch a spring. Again, work is equal to a force times a distance. We'll need to integrate the force since we know that it's constantly changing. It's a linear relationship, but it changes with position. Work is equal to the integral of force ds. But in this case, our force is equal to the spring constant times the change in position. Substituting that into our equation, pulling out the constant k and integrating, we get that our work is equal to 1 half the spring constant times the displacement squared. This is the energy stored in a spring. So, with respect to energy of a particle, when we have kinetic energy, we represent that with 1 half mass times the velocity squared. If I have a 1 kilogram mass that's traveling at 2 meters per second, then my kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mass velocity squared, or in this case 1 half times 1 kilogram times 2 meters per second squared, which would be 2 kilograms meters per second squared times the meters. But a kilogram meter per second squared is a newton, so we have 2 newton meters or 2 joules. For potential energy due to gravity, we have mass times the gravity times the height. If we have a 1 kilogram mass and it's at a height of 5 meters, how much potential energy does the mass have? Well, our potential energy is equal to mass times gravity times the height. We have a 1 kilogram mass. Gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. And the height is 5 meters. So we have 49.05 kilograms meters per second squared meters or 49.05 newton meters, which is 49.05 joules. For a spring, our equation is 1 half the spring constant, k, times the displacement, s, squared. If we have a spring that's been compressed 0.25 meters, and it has a spring constant of 2 newtons per meter, then our potential energy stored in the spring is 1 half ks squared, or 1 half times 2 newtons per meter, times 0.25 meters squared, which is equal to 0.0625 newton meters squared per meter, or 0.0625 newton meters, which is equal to 0.0625 joules. Our next topic is particle kinetics using conservation of energy.